Okay, so uh, uh, this is Kent, and uh, I'm, I'm re-recording uh, the first lecture of the class, uh, just using my iPad, and this time, hopefully, with the microphone on. Um, so maybe, maybe before I, I start, I should say a couple of things. Um, one is that it's, it's a little late at night, so, so I apologize if I'm a little low energy. It's been a long first day of the school year for me. Uh, uh, and two, um, you know, the, the way I, I, I make these slides and lectures is I try to keep it very interactive and there's sort of like a lot of rhetorical uh, moments and stuff like that. So my uh, expectation is that as I do this sort of running through and not pausing to solicit answers from all the, the different students, um, it's gonna go a bit faster. Uh, so in particular, I would be shocked if this came out to be one hour and 15, like the lecture was, and I would encourage you maybe to pause the screen from time to time to try out some of these questions for yourself before I, uh, continue to, to give the answer. Okay. So, okay. So how do we start lecture at the beginning? I presented these two faces and I asked, uh, who are these people? And, uh, the crowd seemed to know that on the left, we have Ada Lovelace. Okay, this amazing historical figure who was sort of coming up with the first algorithms for some geometric problems before computers even existed, but she was able to conceptualize this idea of kind of mechanical uh, processes. Uh, so that's, that's, that's a big deal. And then of course, there's Alan Turing. Uh, it was also a guy who kind of really understood the concept of computation before others, and particularly solved this uh, this big math problem, uh, asking whether all anything can be computed. And, and to solve it, he actually basically proposed the first computer on paper, to some extent inspired by a typewriter. So these are these are really visionary people who kind of anticipate computation before computers exist. That's always amazing to me. Okay, whatever. Moving on, um, you know, I, I spent a little bit of time going over some some syllabus stuff. Uh, I'll go over it again here. The the point I should make, one point I want to make is that um, we're planning to take uh, questions at the beginning of next class so that everyone has some time to go over the syllabus. I, I think there's also been some questions asked over Piazza since that I need to address. So uh, make sure you do that. Uh, so this part was fairly quick then, because it's kind of boring. Uh, I, I wanted to mention that we have five TAs, uh, which is great that we get five uh, graduate TAs. There's also some undergraduate TAs on the way. They'll also help. I'll introduce them later. But one is Mohammed Hassan. He likes to go by Hassan. Uh, Zauni, Nitish, Mohit, and you. Um, look on the syllabus for the office hours. We're working really hard to make sure that we have an office hour every day of the week and maybe two on Thursday because we thought that would be the most popular. Um, so, so hopefully that's helpful to also be leading the PSOs. Um, you also interacted with them on Piazza and, and all of that. Um, they really care. They're also the, the they're kind of on your team. They'll, they're the ones who help me slow down, pace me and stuff like that. So. The, the, the course website is fundamentalalgorithms.com. You may have already seen it and clicked around. Then you would have seen that it's really just one big PDF that has everything in it. Okay, that's sort of maybe clumsy, but it's straightforward and it works and it's concrete. Our goal, you know, going into sort of this, this uncertain semester, I know that I've already gotten lots of emails about, uh, you know, COVID positive testing students. So our goal to sort of combat and make up for this disconnectedness is to try to be really, really organized and really, really explicit on everything. So you'll see in that PDF that there's already a schedule that's planning out the next a bunch of lectures. Yeah, maybe it'll change here and there, but I'm trying to give you as much info as I can. Um, the homework's there in the back. The PSO problems are in the back. The lecture notes are very specific to the lectures. Um, and the syllabus is all there in all its glory. And so we just want to be concrete, get things written down uh, uh, to try to make things a little bit less, you know, ambiguous and stuff. Because, 
you know, maybe we don't get to talk to each other in person as much as, as we would like to. And in particular, you know, please ask, uh, ask us for clarifications so that we can update the syllabus or expand and elaborate on parts of the syllabus. And that information immediately gets propagated out to the whole class once we get it written down. Okay, so that's our approach. Try to write things down, try to be organized. Maybe a couple high level features just to point out, we'll have, that are pretty standard. We'll have weekly homeworks. Uh, there'll be two midterms roughly dividing the class into thirds. The midterms are kind of, the first midterm is worth a little less because everyone kind of groups it up. There's other things, like I put in some tips for success. You're allowed to collaborate uh, uh, with others on your homework. You can submit homework late. There's even this funny thing where you can submit homework late after seeing the solution that's explained in the syllabus. So take a look. There's also Great School Piazza and all that good stuff. Okay, on with the lecture. On with the interesting parts. Okay, so for this first part of the lecture, um, you know, algorithm is sometimes has a reputation for being a daunting class. I want to suggest that you actually already know quite a lot about algorithms and quite a lot about theoretical computer science. And I'll do that in two simple examples. Okay, so we'll start with counting, right? So typically, uh, you know, we learn to count with our fingers. And um, uh, of course, it's, it's uh, uh, very straightforward that we can count to 10, right? So maybe uh, this represents the palms of their hands. I normally would have done this in hand person, of course. But we might white count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Imagine those are my fingers as I face you, right? And of course, that's how we count uh, to 10. Uh, but I will suggest that you can count to 11, right? I can uh, take down that finger there. That's a new arrangement. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Now I've counted to 20, okay? And we could push that logic even further. And what's in fact the biggest number I can count with 10 fingers is 1,023, if we also want to count zero. Why? Because I have 10 fingers, right? Which yes, I can rattle them off one at a time, or I can treat them as bits, right? I have 10 bits, each finger is a bit, and so I'm allowed up to two to the 10 combinations. That lets me count to 1,023 because we also have to include zero. The all ones bit string is 1,023. You already knew that, okay? All right, silly trick, obviously, but it's, it's kind of a big deal. You know, here's two ways to represent the number 23. On the left, I painstakingly drew 23 tallies. It took me like a minute. And on the right, I wrote 23 the way we would. And obviously, the right-hand side is a much better way to express numbers than the left. It's much more efficient. Um, it lets us talk and discuss large numbers that would take forever to write out, right? In general, in decimal notation, the number of, there's k, uh, the number of numbers I can express with k digits, one, zero through nine, is, as the class was pretty quick to answer, 10 to the k, right? Each digit, gives me another set of 10, and they multiply together. And what this really indicates is our first example of a combinatorial explosion, okay? I'm thinking about how many combinations I can make, and it's very vast. It grows very, very rapidly, okay? All right, now let me jump to the other extreme uh, and discuss a, a game that, uh, we played us uh, in my elementary school. I, I think it was like second grade and it was always like right before recess and the teacher would say, okay, you can't leave the room until you guess a number that I'm thinking of between one and a hundred. And get, the rule was we would guess a number and the teacher would say, oh, I'm thinking over or I'm thinking under, okay? And uh, so what we did in that lecture was we played that game. Of course you've played it before and everyone was quick to note that, oh, we should guess 50 first. And then I said over, and then 75, 63, 69, 
Uh, and I said over, but I think someone misheard me and just said 58 for who knows what reason. Um, it was funny. Uh, but then we got back to schedule 72, 71, 70, uh, playing over under in sort of that obvious way. Um, and you understand well, probably. Okay. And so what's the obvious takeaway? That the wrong way to go about this problem is to say loop through and guess every number from one to a hundred, right? That would work. You would of course eventually get the number because you're trying everything, but it's also pretty slow, pretty boring. No way second graders would put up with that. Our fast approach, right, is doing, following this kind of tree where I guess 50 decision tree, and depending on over and under, I'm going to guess either 25 or 75 and stuff like that. And why? If I guess 50, what I do is in either case, I eliminate half the options, right? If it's over, the guess is between 51 and 100, uh, or the secret number is between 51 and 100. If it's under, the secret number is between 49 and 1, okay? But I've eliminated half the options in each round, okay? So how many rounds uh, will this take? Well, each round, decreases the number of possibilities by a factor of two. So we have a, a, a nice way to express exactly this, which is log base two of 100, which is like roughly 6.67 or something like that, which if you do your fence post correctly, actually implies you need six rounds. Okay. But really the key thing is this log base two of the total size, log base two is really saying how many times do I need a half the number 100 to get down to basically one, okay? All right, so these are two, two functions. Uh, so now we have these two functions that insofar as you understood how decimal digits work and insofar as you could play the over under game, you really understood how these functions work uh, and you've known it since you were probably very young. So we have exponential functions, right? Two to the n is taking two and multiplying it by itself n times. Um, and the logarithm is how many times you have to half a number to get down to one. So it's defined by this identity, two to the log two n is equal to n, okay? And of course, there could be other bases besides two. As you know, there's a natural log for the Euler constant. There's log base 10 of n, which we often see in science. But in general, there's log base B of N uh, for arbitrary bases greater than one. And this is uh, defined by the identity B to the log B of N is equal to N. Okay, so log B of N will be whatever value makes this correct. Okay, fine, so that's two functions. So I try to think of an example to really exaggerate um, the dramatic effect of taking the logarithm of a number. So I tried to think of the biggest natural number. So, so I thought that would be the number of atoms in the universe. Uh, there's a name for this, it's called the Eddington number. Eddington is, a, is quite the character himself. Among other things, I think he conducted the experiment to, to verify Einstein's relativity theory, but he did a lot of other things too. Uh, okay, so if you ask Google, and we'll just trust Google. If we don't trust Google, then oh no. Uh, there's, I guess, 10 to the 82 atoms or so in the universe. Okay. So let's take the logarithm base 2 of the number of atoms in the universe. So let me write down 10 to the 82. And uh, it just follows from the definition, and probably you know this as an identity from high school or something, uh, that this is actually equal to uh, you can take the 82 on the outside, and you get 82 times log base 2 of 10. Uh, log base 2 of 10 happens to be 3.32. It should be pretty easy to see that it's between 3 and 4, just because 10 is between 10 and 16, or 8 and 16. Okay, but I've done the calculations here. So, and then we did a little bit of math. That comes out to roughly 27, 270.6, especially if I'm just multiplying uh, 82 times 3.3, okay? All right, so log base two of the number of atoms is roughly 270.6. 
right? So that's that's already pretty dramatic. We've gone from astronomical to a number that's sort of modest. You can count to 270.6 or 271 uh, using your fingers in binary. Now for extra dramatic effect, let's take the logarithm again. Okay. So what happens when I take the logarithm twice of the number of atoms in the universe? Uh, I'll do a different color. The log base two of 270.6 was the log base two of 270.6. Okay, I don't really know, but I do know that two to the eight is 256 and that's awfully close. So it should be eight point something. Okay, a little bit more than eight. Okay. All right, so if you take the log twice of the biggest number I can think of, you get eight, a little bit more than eight. Uh, so that's, that's very dramatic. Obviously you can count to eight on your fingers the old fashioned way. Okay, so at this point I want to suggest, especially before, you know, the class picks up and I overwhelm you with all these new ideas. While everything is still simple and the slate is clean, I want to suggest that algorithms is trying to distinguish between combinatorial explosion and, and situations where you can use something like binary search. So about sort of distinguishing the function two to the n. This is our worst nightmare. Um, from log base two of n, Okay, so combinatorial explosion is saying uh, there's so many possibilities out there and somehow we have to eliminate large numbers of them and make tremendous deductions uh, uh, over a large range of possibilities. Log base 2 of n, when I do binary search, when I do over under, what it really signifies is structure, right? There's a structure to the thing I'm working with. I know the numbers are sorted so I can actually pick the middle one and eliminate half at a time, but that requires some structure. So when you can do take the log base two of n, you're taking your n moving parts and you're identifying a lot of symmetry and you're doing something much more efficient. Okay. So in that sense, we're trying to distinguish this thing, one regime from the other. And as simple as that sounds, you'll see that we don't know, we don't really understand this very well. Okay. All right, so much for that. Part two is about sorting, okay? So, all right, sorting. I know you guys have probably seen this before. The input consists of n numbers. Here, I, I've, I think I have 11 numbers. And the goal is to sort them, let's say, for us, in increasing order, okay? So for this, I guess the increasing order would be, and we actually did this as a class, one, two, four, five, six, seven, seven, eight, nine, nine, eleven. Hopefully I did that right. Okay, that will give me a sorted list. Okay, I guess visually I can think of, you know, uh, sort of plotting the values up and down and it's sort of chaotic. I guess I drew it as a wave, but it could be much more chaotic than that. And when I produce a sorted list, the values are just going to be increasing like that. Right? So it'll be nice and clean afterwards. Okay. All right, so I'll start with uh, uh, a pretty basic algorithm, an uh, intuitive algorithm. If I was given a set of numbers as a person, how would I personally sort these numbers? How did I just sort these numbers above? Okay, well, the first thing I would do is I would ask myself, what is the first number uh, in sorted order? Okay. Uh, and that's what I'll ask first. And of course, that's the number one. And so I would write it down. Okay. What's the next question I would ask myself? Well, I would ask myself, what is the second number in sorted order? Okay. I will scan my list again. Notice I've already taken one. That means two is our next winner and put that down. What would I do next? 
well, I'd probably try to find a third number and so forth. Okay, I think that most of us would sort numbers this way. It's the most natural thing to do, in my opinion. Okay, so human sort is sort of building out a sort of list from beginning to end. Each time we will scan the list of n inputs and identify the next smallest number. Okay. All right, so let's try to analyze how long this algorithm would take. Okay, so how many iterations do we have? Well, we have one iteration for every number we output. So that's n. And each iteration, I rescan the entire list of elements. Okay. And so that comes out to roughly n items per iteration. Really, if you're careful, you might notice that with some bookkeeping, you can keep decreasing the size of the list. So maybe it goes n, and then n minus 1, n minus 2, n minus 3, n minus 4, and so forth. And so you might worry that just giving an overestimate of n, you're losing a lot. But it's not really that big a deal because if you think about it, at least n over 2 of those iterations will have at least n over 2 items. So it's still going to come out similar, even if you're more careful. So overall, we multiply the times together and we get an n squared running time. Again, I'm not being very precise about constants, but it's roughly n squared. Okay. So I, I put the code here, but I mean, I think we all know. Uh, it was pointed out, however, that this algorithm is not called insertion sort, probably, and it's more likely to be called, hopefully I get this right, selection sort. So I'll update the notes. Okay, what do I know? I don't know the name of anything. All right. Now, but that's not the point. The point here is that the algorithm we're going to say runs in big O of n squared time. Okay, what does that mean? I know maybe you guys have been exposed to this before. So big O of n squared means that there exist constants, say C and N, uh, such that um, for all inputs of size N greater than N, uh, the algorithm runs in at most C N squared steps. Okay, so there's two things to point out. A, I'm only interested in very large values of n, right? Because I'm really interested in the growth rate, the asymptotic growth rate as a function of the input. Why? Because it's the big problems that are actually hard and the big problems that, that kind of stretch our imagination. Okay, now the next uh, feature of this definition is we said it takes at most cn squared steps for some constant c. Okay, and I also put quotations around steps because it's not really clear what a step is. Right? I mean, if you were to be really precise about it, then you'll find that it, somehow it, it probably needs to take into account what programming language you're using, the computer you're using, I don't know, various other things, whether or not the sun is sending photons off of your memory. Um, but, uh, you know, it's not really clear what is and isn't exactly a step, okay? But we can generally agree what kind of constitutes roughly a constant number of steps versus some n steps for n sufficiently large, okay? And, and where we disagree on what is a step and what is a few steps, it'll only affect the constant, okay? But what's really going on is that by allowing for this constant and not worrying about the constant, I'm also saying that I'm not really worried about which computer and language exactly I'm doing it in. Okay, so now we can sort of work, focus on more abstract ideas that are independent of the exact computation environment, which we know is always changing anyway. And, and by hiding a constant then, and, and, and therefore basically hiding the hardware and hiding these extraneous factors that don't change much, we're able to develop a general theory of algorithms and talk about ideas yeah, in this much more general way. Okay. So that's, that's really what the big O represents. It represents a step tower, sort of a higher, more abstract and general theory.
Okay. So we've now seen that that human sort takes uh, n squared time, quadratic time. It's a quadratic function of n. So the natural question is to ask, can we do better? What is n squared? Well, to me, n squared, it sort of signifies the fact that every number is compared to every other number in the input, right? Because there's n choose two pairs, which uh, as we all know, n times n minus one over two, okay, that's roughly n squared. So n squared running time is really coming from the fact that I'm comparing every pair of numbers with each other when I do my human sort. Okay. So when I ask when we can do better, at some level I'm asking, can we sort all the numbers without comparing every pair of numbers? And do we really need to do all the comparisons? Can you do less? Now I realize that many people know uh, other sorting algorithms, they know the answer, but it's still an interesting question, you know, and that we maybe we take for granted. Okay, so let me take a slightly different perspective. Um, where I'm going to ask, uh, how long does it take to verify something is sorted? So this is sort of a general approach. You're looking at some problem and you don't know how to solve it, but you can't ask for that problem. Do I know how to double check that a solution exists? And that's what we're doing here. How long would it take me to double check that a list is in fact sorted, right? How long does it take to verify that an array that I'm given is sorted? Okay. So I asked this to the class and, and it was answered correctly. It takes only linear time because given a set of numbers such as this, to figure out that the, the list is sorted, I really only need to check that A1 is less than equal to A2, and that A2 is less than equal to A3, and A3 is less than equal to A4, and so forth. Okay, So this only requires big O n queries. Okay. All right, so whatever, here's some code. It's not very interesting. The only point is that I, we can check to see if an array is a sorted in linear time. Okay, so now we have this gap, right? We have this very natural, simple n squared time algorithm. And, but we also know that we can double check a solution in n time. And so the question is, is there anything in the middle, right? Can I, can I, can I sort something closer to the time it takes to verify? n seems like a natural lower bound. I don't think I can verify any better. And if I can't verify better, I can't sort better. But, but how close to n can I get? And that's, that's sort of the next question. Okay. All right. So now as a prelude whew, to our eventual algorithm, let me give you now um, a specific special case. So uh, suppose I told you that the input list was sort of like halfway sorted in the following sense. The first half of the list was already sorted in increasing order, and the second half of the list was also sorted in increasing order, but not amongst each other. So something in the second half can be smaller than something in the first half. But within the two halves, it's already sorted. Okay, so in that sense, this list is sort of partially sorted for us, but it's not completely sorted. So my question to the class was, in this special case, can I do something better, right? In this special case, do I need to spend n square time or not? Okay. All right, so. Um, right? Okay, so suppose I ran human sort, I guess, on this kind of input, right? Uh, and in human sort, the first thing uh, we would do is try to find the smallest element. Now, in the old days, we used to run through the whole list um, and, and to find the smallest element. But here, in our special case, I really don't need to look at everything. I only need to look at the beginning of the two lists. Okay. And let's say maybe it turns out to be on the left-hand side. Right. Now I need to find the second smallest element. Well, we should only look at the second item in that first list and in the first item in the second list again and try to identify the smaller element. 
right? And then keep going, okay? But the point is that to produce the next smallest element, rather than scanning through the whole list, I only have to look at two elements, wherever I left off in each of the two lists. So to implement this, you might want to keep some pointers to keep track of where you are in both of those lists. Okay. But you do this and you end up only having to take linear time to produce one sorted list. Okay. So this is sometimes called merging to sorted list and it's going to take linear time. Here n is the total combined size of the two lists. In our case, they're both the same size, but really didn't have to be. So I put some, some pseudocode here for merging two lists is exactly what you would think. And it just, you know, the notation is clunky. Okay. All right, so we have this merging operation and I'm gonna now use it to try to give a better algorithm using a, a, a design principle called divide and conquer. We're gonna get exposed to divide and conquer today. We'll do a little bit insofar as it relates to sorting. And we're really gonna double down on divide and conquer uh, later, several weeks down the line. Okay. But okay, so what do I know? I know that if I had two sorted lists, I could then combine it in linear time, essentially for free. So merging is, is, is great, right? That's not gonna be the bottleneck. But to merge, um, uh, again, okay, so just to take a step back, now the goal is to develop a general sorting algorithm. So it's not half half sorted like before. So I want to do it a general case. And, and so I know that merging is okay. So if I can take two halves of my list and, and sort them somehow, then I can combine the solution together afterwards uh, very well. Okay. But the question is, okay, I've taken my input and I can split it into two halves, a first half and a second half. Okay, so the input array is A. And I wanna sort each of these. And, and the question is now how, and it, it feels a little bit like cheating because the original question was, how do I sort N items? And now I'm saying, ah, well, look, I'm gonna split it into two lists of size N over two. I'll figure out how to sort those. And then I'm gonna merge them back together. And then of course I would have to ask, or you would have to ask, well, how do I sort the list of size n over two, right? And so on and so forth. I'm just kind of pushing a question down. And it turns out that's okay, right? Because we can use recursion, right? I can sort each half of the array recursively using the same function we're defining. And that's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna sort the first half of A recursively and the second half of A recursively. And induction hypothesis, and there is a, a well sound induction hypothesis because the problems are getting smaller and smaller. Okay, of course you have to take care of obvious base cases, like if there's only one element in the list, then you should just return the list and you know those obvious things. But assuming you do that, uh, you're in good shape. Okay, so that's what our algorithm is going to be. I'm going to take my input list, divide it in half, sort each half recursively, and I'm going to merge them back together. So here's, here's some pseudocode. And you can see that um, I'm taking care of my base cases here. If it's a list of size one or zero, then I just return it, okay? Otherwise, I'm finding that middle index and here's the first half of the list. There's the second half of the list and I'm recursively using the function that I'm simultaneously defining, okay? That'll sort the two halves of the list and I return the two lists merge together, which takes O n time. Okay. All right, so correctness comes from, well, the base case is correct. This is sort of easy to see because it, it just check, right? For zero, it does the right thing. For one, it does the right thing. Uh, now, this, these two are going to be able to sort these sublists by induction on the number of elements, okay? because k is smaller than n, at least when n is at least two. That's also another reason why I had to include the base case so that I don't worry about k equals one and getting into a weird loop. Okay, so these parts are correct by induction. And I know we've already argued that if b and c are sorted, then merge will produce their sorted combination. 
uh, or yeah, the, the, the sum of the list sorted. Okay, so that's so much for collective. The next thing is the running time. So we're going to model this mathematically. And we're going to start by defining a function, defining some symbols. And I'm going to say, look, T of n denotes, it means semantically, the time spent by the algorithm on an input of size n. Okay, I have to give it meaning before I can manipulate or else the manipulations are just nonsense. Okay. So the base cases is just a constant. So I put one there, but it could be any constant. It's not a big deal. Okay. The interesting case is when n is bigger than 1. And for simplicity, I'm going to assume n is even, but that's actually not necessary. You can read the parts in the notes. And I'm going to say t of n is equal to, well, let's say first I need to spend uh, linear time to do the merge. right? So I'll write big O of n, but the constant doesn't really matter. So I'll just write plus n. And the remaining time besides the linear time is that I have two subproblems of size n over 2. Right? So I have two recursive subcalls to problems of size n over 2, and then I also add n. So let me let me clean this up a little bit. The recursion is 2 times t to the n over 2 plus n. Really big O of n, but I'm lazy. So I haven't really obtained the running time, but I have been able to model it somewhat compactly in a short recursive formula. Okay. All right. Now the question is, how do I solve this, this recursion? I'll put it up here for reference. Okay. So I'm going to define, uh, describe a, a technique called the recursion tree method. And what it sort of is, it's, it's, it's a very nice way to solve recurrences because it also helps you visualize the running time and sort of see the calculations uh, come out in front of you. And, and as a result, you actually walk away with some amount of extra intuition um, for the algorithm itself. And, and you build some intuition for why certain recurrences come out this way or that. So it's a very robust method. Um, that I'm, I'm basically going to force you guys to use so that you guys have a tool that can be used in new situations. You know, there are sort of shortcuts out there that are sort of like calculators, um, but they're not going to teach you anything about the algorithm, although maybe they can output some correct answers. So so I'm going to discourage that and, and encourage methods such as this, uh, which are more robust. Okay. So recursion tree. So the idea behind recursion tree is that I'm going to actually think about the subproblems that are generated recursively, arranged in a tree. Okay, so this is sort of the the input problem. This is the root problem. Okay, and so this would be the you know the the subproblems of size n over two of the root. Okay, and then the grandchildren will be subproblems of those subproblems and so forth. All right, so I'm just pointing this out. I wouldn't actually write that part out normally. Now, what I do is I start filling out the tree by writing down the input size of each node, of each subproblem. So the input starts with n elements. I have two children. Each, the input size is n over 2. Okay. And then each of these have input size n over 4. And of course, uh, eventually it'll get down to one at the bottom. So here, all I've done is annotate the problems as their size. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start um, calculating um, the amount of work. So, um, in particular, when I look at this, um, and I'm going to try to calculate the amount of work ignoring the recursive subcalls. Okay, so this subproblem is going to generate n work, n over 2 work, n over 2 work, uh, n over 4, uh, and so forth. Okay, so this is the work of the problem excluding the subproblems, right? Because I have this work n and then the, the subproblems are going to account for the recursive calls. 
Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add up the total amount of work for every level. So I did n units of work on the first level. Now I have 2 times n over 2. I also do n units of work on the second level. I also do n units of work on the third level. And you can see that it's going like that. Every level is going to be n. Okay. It happens to be that this problem is very clean, but it's not always like that. You may have cases uh, where maybe there's some factor increasing, like it could be two thirds here, two thirds n, and then two thirds n squared, two thirds squared n, and then this would be two over three q. So you can get kind of a geometric series in that way. It could be going the opposite direction where it's getting bigger. Maybe it's three halves, three half squared, three half cubed. We'll have lots of exercises, and you'll see that the behavior can be different on the right hand side, so that. The toweling up at the end might be a little bit more involved, but you'll get used to that as well. Okay, so so uh, every level generates a total amount of work of n. So now the question is, how many levels are there? So this I also posted a question and they to the class, and they answered pretty quickly that the height of this tree is log base two of n because every time I go down a level, the number of nodes decreases by half. Okay. So now when, that means when I tally everything up, the total running time is n times log base 2 of n, you know, times some constant. Okay. So total running time is n log n. But the great thing about this tree is you can visualize um, the whole thing. Okay. It's, not, it's not algebraic magic. Okay. All right. Okay, so 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 at the end we've shown that uh, the running time of this algorithm called merge short is n log n, which is of course much better than our previous running time of n square. Okay, good. So much for merge short. So now I move on to the the last section of the lecture, and this is about lower bounds for sorting. Okay, so this is a very different perspective uh, than what we just did, and maybe a different perspective uh, uh, for most in this class. This idea of trying to identify a lower bound for a problem. Okay, so um, we've now seen that merge sort takes n log n, and we should be pretty happy because that's a big improvement on n squared. Nonetheless, we might ask if you can do better. And you might ask, if it's the best possible, can we show that merge sort is an optimal sorting algorithm? That seems sort of dramatic, right? Because there's some sort of absoluteness to that statement. Okay, so is merge sort optimal in some sense? So what we're going to do now is we're going to try to prove lower bounds, okay, on sorting algorithms. But not even a sorting algorithm in particular. I want to somehow show that any sorting algorithm must take such and such a running time. Okay, so this is uh, quite challenging because there's so many sorting algorithms that we've never imagined. So somehow I have to make an argument that at a different level of abstraction to be able to argue that any possible sorting algorithm, not just merge sort, not such just human sort, not just your favorite sorting algorithm, but any sorting algorithm must take a certain amount of time. This is very kind of ambitious um, and abstract question. In a way, I think it's sort of harder than proving an upper bound because there you only need one particular algorithm and you show that algorithm takes a certain amount of time. So there's a certain concreteness and specificity to that discussion that you know it doesn't seem to come so easily for lower bounds okay so i'm going to yeah try to show that any correct algorithm has to take some big omega f of n times some function of n here big omega is just like big o of n but it's for lower bounds so that means okay there's constant c and capital n such that for all n Input size is greater than capital N. The running time takes at least C times F of N times. Okay, it's the exact same as big O, just lower bounds. Okay. Now, 
one thing really interesting in this discussion, I mean, the, the, I think this is really the key idea, is that we end up kind of focusing on a very specific model. So this is called the comparison model or the comparison only model. Um, and the input consists of n comparable numbers, right? And, and at some level, you don't know much about them. I mean, they're not numbers, they're just elements, but I promise you that there, there does exist an ordering. And the only info we can get out of these elements is, is, is by comparison queries. So I can ask questions like, is xi less than xj? Um, and that is, uh, and, and uh, the answer is either yes or no. Okay, so I can only do comparison queries. And my goal is to lower bound uh, the number of comparison queries for any correct algorithm. Okay, so this is already kind of interesting. Now, I'll make a couple of comments. One is that all the algorithms we've just discussed so far have all been in this model, right? Merce sort only compared numbers, human sort only compared numbers. So, so uh, that sort of covers the algorithms we've discussed. Um, and it's a pretty reasonable model. But, you know, that means that whatever bound we come up with uh, is not going to be useful in bounding any algorithm that isn't based on comparison queries. So it is true that if you have, uh, you know, integers of fixed number of bit strings, then you can start playing games where you're comparing the most significant bit first, and then the second most significant bit, and so on and so forth. And you can get kind of funky running times uh, that in some sense might be better than n log n. But then you're taking advantage of the explicit representation of bits, which also means you're taking advantage of the fact there's only kind of so many numbers out there and, and, and stuff like that, so, uh, and so forth. So anyway, so we're working within this comparison only model and I just want to lower bound the number of comparisons that are required. Um, and of course, I think in any reasonable uh, algorithmic situation, each comparison should take at least constant time so that means uh, that also give us a lower bound on the running time, again, only for this comparison model. Okay, so how do we even pose an analysis, right? Because it's sort of funky. So I'm gonna say, ah, uh, so, so take, take some algorithm. I don't know anything about this algorithm really, but suppose it makes at most K queries. Okay, and then output some list. And that's all I know about the algorithm. I'm assuming really very little. Okay, so it makes queries and it might be adaptive. So first it asks uh, two numbers and it finds out yes or no. And based on the answer to that, then it chooses its second question, right? It could be adaptive. And then maybe it gets the answer and then it makes its third query. It gets its answer, the fourth query, so on and so forth. Okay, it makes K queries or at most K queries and just as a function of those k queries, it outputs some list of numbers that it claims to be sorted. Okay, so I really don't know much about this algorithm beyond this these parameters, but we do know something, right? I know that that really, if you just kind of look at the transcript, the yes, no, yes, no, and the answers to the queries, that actually ultimately produces the list. Like the algorithm, that's the only input it's getting, so the only information. So so the output is really a function of these k queries. And every query is just a yes no question. So it has at most two outcomes. Okay. So if the output is a function of k queries, each of which can have be on or off, yes or no, then I can actually output two to the k different lists. Okay, because each list is tied to a different combination of yes, no outcomes. Okay. Um, on the other hand, how many possible lists are there? Out of n numbers, so that's the number of permutations of n numbers, which as you guys may know is n factorial. So n factorial is you know n choices for the first number, n minus one choices for the second number, n minus two for the third, down to one, okay? So just for the algorithm to be able to output all possible lists, that means the number of queries must satisfy two to the K is at least n factorial, okay? So that actually gives us some lower bound on K. We're making some progress. 
for, at this point, I now just want to simplify and put things in terms of K and, and pull out something that's easier for me to interpret. So if 2 to the K is at least n factorial, I can take the log of both sides and get that K is at least log base 2 of n. Okay. And um, uh, right. And and now, uh, sorry, not log base two of n. Rats. Uh, log base two of n uh, factorial. And now from here, I just want to make it even easier for me to understand. So I want to find a nice, easy lower bound for n factorial that's easier to interpret. Uh, so one that you might not think is good enough, but in fact it is going to be. And a simple one is to look at this list and say, well, the numbers are going down, but at least half of them are bigger than n over 2. Okay, So n factorial is at least n over 2 to the n over 2. And so if I plug that in, now we get that k is at least log base 2 of n over 2 to the n over 2. And of course, you know, I can take the n over 2 on the outside. Uh, and I get roughly n log n, right? So up to constants. This is n log n. So this is kind of quite interesting. We've actually given this, this bound that says that in the comparison only model, any sorting algorithm actually has to make at least roughly n log n comparisons, right? And at some level, if you look back, the algorithm wasn't, it was kind of simple, but I think that the style of the algorithm is very new. So I think that unusualness makes it hard, but actually the, 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 the steps, the, the logic wasn't, Really, that that's that's a complicated. It's just coming from this interesting perspective. Okay. Um, all right. So let me let me summarize what's going on here. We, we've shown an upper bound of n log n comparisons and also running time with merge sort. And we've also shown that you need at least n log n time, if, assuming that each comparison takes at least constant time. Okay. So we have an upper bound, we have a lower bound. Now, in general, just by definition of lower and upper, any lower bound needs to be less than equal to any upper bound. Okay. But in our case, we also have an upper bound that's within a constant of the lower bound. Okay. And so now what happens is that they're all kind of sandwiching each other. And actually, what this shows is not just that the upper bound is good or just that the lower bound is good. It's, it actually shows that they're both basically optimal up to a constant factor, right? Because the lower bound was always uh, upper bounded by the upper bound, but you also know that the lower bound is only a constant factor uh, away from being bigger than the upper bound. So my lower bound is now within a constant of being the best possible lower bound. And likewise, I, I know that my upper bound is within a constant factor of being the best possible constant. And so what I'm suggesting is that, you know, because we often think of upper bounds and lower bounds as sort of being in opposition, like they're competing against each other. And it's true that mathematically, you know, one is less than equal to the other. So there is, you know, some tension. But on the other hand, I also want to suggest that there's sort of two sides of the same coin. And in fact, it's the part where you put them next to each other and realize they're both optimal simultaneously. That's what makes the, in this case, the conclusion so strong, right? Because we can mutually certify them to be each other. Okay. All right. And so, so we see that, that n log n is, is really the right answer for sorting in the comparison model. And that merge sort is actually an optimal, not just good, not just better than human sort but actually optimal up to maybe constants in this comparison model. Okay, so okay, so lower bounds is also that it's gonna come up in this class and it's gonna be challenging because it's a different way of looking at things. But it's very insightful, so we must do it. Okay, 
so that's that's basically where we ended um and that's when we ran out of time uh i listed some other sorting algorithms just for fun if we had time but we didn't uh but i wrote a little bit about it in the notes if you're curious um uh, there are some more slides about that okay so that's where we left off and uh uh, for those who aren't feeling well, please um, get well soon and, um, and hope to meet you soon. All right. Thank you. Good night.